body of Christ. Everybody wishes they had it. Everybody hopes for it. They pray for it, but they don't realize that they already have it. And you know, the one thing about being a Christian that you got to understand is, man, I don't even know how to say this without being mean. The number one thing that involves being a Christian is paying attention. Paying attention to realities. Pay, paying attention to things that you've already been given. There's so many people interpreting the Bible in so many different ways that they make mistakes. So we pray that today we don't make that kind of mistake for you. That we're here to offer you the best possible journey through the Word that you could ever experience. And that you can gain victory at every turn. Amen? Alright, so let's read. All right, because of what Jesus has done for us, we are powerful people. How many know that you're powerful even in the midst of all your weakness? The only reason you are made weak is so that he can show himself strong on your behalf. Now, it doesn't matter what you're going through. Some of us go through the worst possible scenarios in life, but God sees fit to find the joy in you and make you strong. Now, I don't know about you, but I've gone through a lot of stuff in the last 12 years because I'm only 13. I know, I look old for my age, just wisdom, hallelujah. Just go with that, no act. Where has the time gone? Anyway, well, God wants to use you. No matter what age you come to him at, God wants to use you. And how does he use you? I'll tell you how God uses you. He takes the worst possible scenario, because most, I'm going to look around this room just as an example. You guys represent some of the worst experiences life could ever offer anybody. <laughs> yeah, okay, Allah laughing. Hallelujah. You know what? You, if you come to Christ in the worst possible, man, time of your life, how many know that God has chosen you for greatness? I don't know about you, but who else can you go to to share your life experience that doesn't have experience that you would trust? So I would trust somebody that's gone through it and is victorious, not somebody who's going to give me the hope and the dreams I want the reality. How many of you like reality? How many of you like somebody who has experience? Amen. That's what we are. We're experienced people. All of you in here, most of you, I'll say not all of you. Most of you have experienced hardcore living. Some of you still hardcore. Anyway. Come on now. Some of you in here right now hung over. I'm not even going to look because you're going to think I... I'm too prophetic, you can see. Okay. All right, as believers, there's nothing going on in our life that we do not have the authority to overcome. You can overcome anything in this life, okay? How many know that there is no loss in Christ Jesus? There's only gain. Why? Because heaven is your permanent home. How many know that you came from heaven? You just don't remember. Hallelujah. You got bad software. Your pre-installed software comes the minute you enter earth, and this is all you know is this. But how you know? You had to come from someplace to go someplace. And here you are, and you're trying to make sense out of this life. This life, let me just share this with you. I deal with thousands and thousands of people every month. Let me tell you something. This life don't make sense. It don't make sense. Look at all the stuff you went through. Can you make sense of what you went through? No. So you come to a place, you're looking for answers you're looking for meaning let me tell you something i'm the wrong guy (laughs) but jesus is the right guy and he chooses to use me so i do my best to help you along amen have i been there for many of you i didn't get an amen on some you're gonna get it right after this you kept me up late a couple times (laughs) no it's my pleasure to pour out my life for you amen so do the same for somebody else. Amen. That's all I can ask is that we be a real church. When you see one of us in the store, don't act like you don't know them. That's the other kind brand of church. Over here, you see one of us, this is family. Amen. You walk right up to them and you hug them and you get in their business and you take their wallet and you use them at Walmart. <laughs> well, that's what family does, right? Yeah, I can borrow you a lot more. No more time frame on that because it's family. Amen. All right. Don't worry. It's because of the electricity. You guys hear all that? Static. Some of you have to trot there. Yeah. All right. Now, the, the authority to overcome is given to you, and God doesn't tell you when you're going to use it. 
Amen. You're just going to use it. How many of you are being given an opportunity right now to understand authority and you're trying to figure it out? You've, you're trying to figure it out because you want to conquer something. You know, everybody's in this business to conquer. Let me share something with you. This church here, we're not in competition with any other church. Okay, I just want to set the record straight. We're not trying to be the best church. We're just trying to be the best church for you. I'm not trying to compete with any X, Y, Z down the road. I'm not trying to put my name out there. I'm not trying to, you know, put marketing strategies to try and grow the church. You know what grows a church? Real people. How many of you are real people? How many of you have real life experiences? Then you are a reason that God wants to use for somebody else. All right? So just realize that. All right, now, hallelujah. You can see that, man, electricity in the air still. Hot. I know, thanks. No, look at me like that, bro. I charge extra. Okay. <laughs> if you paint to be around me, you got problems, serious problems. What can I help you with? All right, now, this is the result of the relationship between spiritual authority and spiritual law. Let me share something about law. Everybody like, and I don't mean to talk bad about churches, but here's the deal. The Ten Commandments were given so that man could find out that they couldn't accomplish the law. And that they had a real need for a real God. God didn't want to do it, but they wanted it. So that's why you have the Ten Commandments and all these laws. And you know what? After all of the sacrifices of Jesus, people are still talking about the Ten Commandments. Man, if you need rules to live by... You really got serious problems. You know what that's trying to do, right? It's trying to keep you hostage to somebody. Let me tell you something. In here, you have the freedom to live. That's why you keep coming back, because you are free indeed. He whom the sun sets free is free indeed, so you are free indeed. So live your life, amen? You come here, we help clean you up, we send you out. You're here for somebody else. Remember that. You're not here for yourself. You come here for yourself at first. Once you get it all sorted out, you're here for somebody else. Amen? So some of you right now are like, oh, but I need. Yeah, we all need. We all need attention. Amen? I mean, you need attention. Remember, we're not a group of monkeys picking ticks off of each other. Amen? We're here not even to stroke each other's fur. We're just here to send you out, go help somebody. Amen? Because let me tell you, life is so short. It's so short. Man, in my 13 years of living, hallelujah, amen, I'll be honest, I turned half a century a couple months ago, and you know what, I still feel like I'm 21, you know what, because there's a different outlook, you know, you look at things through eyes of youth, or you look at it from old eyes, some of you get some old eyes, okay, hey amen, you guys okay, some of you, I know it's hot, but shut up. I'm more hot than you, okay? Now, read this, okay? This law transcends the performance-based do good and get good law of Moses. Prayer is good, and we need to maintain a strong prayer life. How many of you pray every day? Let me, let me tell you this. If you didn't raise your hand, I got news for you. No matter what you think and no matter what you're doing, you, everything you say is a prayer. Somebody is listening. Hello? If you don't like what's happening in your life, it's probably because you're praying it. Jesus attributed praying and saying as the same thing. Whatever you pray, you will get. Whatever you say, you will get. So whether you take the formal position of prayer or if you take the casual position of sayer, either way, you're going to get whatever comes out of your lips. Hello. So how many of you want to change in your life? Simple. Change the way you think. You change the way you speak. You change the way you speak. If God creates the earth and the heavens with words, how many of you know that you're creating your own heaven and earth? With words. So what kind of words did you use when you looked in the mirror this morning? Did you use words of creativity or destruction? Did you say, oh my God, in the right way when you looked in the mirror? Some of you not even paid attention. Did you look at yourself in the mirror and say, oh, my God? Or did you say, oh, my God? You see, you can turn things. You can pray or you can say, but whatever it is, you're going to create your atmosphere. Amen? 
So whether you believe me or not, let me just tell you something. Think back to the last thing you said and how stupid you called yourself and see if it was proven. I'm waiting. Go ahead. Take your time. Because we all have opportunity every day to call ourselves stupid. I was so stupid. I should have did this. I could have did this. Well, today is your day of shoulda, woulda, coulda tomorrow. So do what you're supposed to do today. Start speaking life and creativity. Amen? You guys all cool with that? Good. Then speak creativity over your name and say, you are blessed. And you are handsome. You are beautiful. You are smart. And try not to roll your eyes when you say it. Amen? You got to mean the things that you want to come back to you. Amen? So not only do you pray and say, but you also got to realize whatever you sow out, you will reap. Not just for yourself, but for others. So if you want to be rich, you not only sow money, but you got to speak prosperity into people. Say, you are rich. And then you will reap a harvest of riches. Amen? All right. High five your neighbor and say good morning. All right. You all good? You all good? Even if you're not good, you better pretend. All right. Uh, I can go through all of these notes, but let me just speak from my heart today. How many of you like when I speak from my heart because you're the greatest example I could ever use? Let's go to the notes then. Okay. <laughs> you know what is hard, right? Because I know all of you pretty well and what you go through, I got to be careful sometimes with what I say. Because some of you think that I'm telling you a story out of school here. And uh, I don't mean to, but you resemble a lot of people out there. I try and change the gender sometimes. And some of you like, you sucker, you're talking about me, eh, Pastor? <laughs> oh, how you know? Anyway, we're all good, amen. All right. I want you to turn to this Matthew 14. Let's take a look at a story. Because some of you like my intellect. Some of you hate my intellect because there's too much common sense in it. Now, you guys know this story, I'm sure. And if you don't, then hey, just act like you do. Just say amen a lot and you can fake your way through anything. You guys didn't, that's one of the great secrets of acting like you're a holy person. Just say amen, hallelujah, and thank you, Jesus. A lot. And you can fool all your friends. <laughs> and he's the associate pastor. Everybody practice, say amen. Say hallelujah. Say thank you, Jesus. Say this one. God is good. <laughs> Bunch of liars. All right. I always say that. If, you, if you're an old timer, you hear me say this all the time. When somebody uses that phrase or a sentence with all of that in the sentence, I know they're full of crap. You know why? They're hiding something. Ah. And you know what? I just look at them like, hallelujah, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus. But not you, amen? You cannot bull eye your way out of everything in this life. How many of you know that you got to face some things head on, whether you like it or not? You know, the number one thing that people come to me with, the number one problem in this church is many of you had to go court. I'm not going to say why. But many of you had to go court. Many of you had to deal with family issues. And let me tell you this. Court is a thing. If you don't show up, what happens to you? You're in contempt. So uh, you're you're at risk now. They send out a warrant to arrest you. Our church has dealt with way more arrest warrants than any other church in the history of Hilo. I promise. I'm not even... (laughs) I have my cousin. Okay, I'll tell you this story. He comes to me. He goes, cuz, I need your help. I'm like, what do you need my help with? He goes, bro, I get 2,000 hours community service. I got to do. You can sign up for me. It's due next week. <laughs> if you work eight hours a day for a whole year, that equates to around 2,000 hours. How are you supposed to justify in like five days, 2,000 hours of community service? Hallelujah. And all the while, he's working a full-time job. So now, how many of you know that we got to pray about these things? And you know, what I did was I sent a letter off to the court, and the court wrote me back, and they reduced it all the way down to 200 hours. 
How did God do that? I don't know. I went, you tell me. God does some crazy things on behalf of his people. But he has to have a willing participant. How many of you are willing to let God do something in your life today? If you are willing and you don't lay claim to any of your life stuff, you know, like my asthma, my cancer, my brain damage or whatever, do you know that God can move mountains for you? You know, I had a guy who was facing 20 years in prison. I won't say why because he might be in here today or listening. 20 years in prison, God reduced it all the way down to six months. And you know, we, it came to be that we understood that here's what happened. The crime that he committed, he wasn't the one committing the crime. He just so happened to be in the area. And now he had a reputation of crime. So he wasn't totally like a white woolly lamb himself. But the thing is, God gave him six months deferred acceptance. So what happened is he turned his whole life around. He's a pastor now in California. Now, can God do something with you? Yeah, but don't wait for God to move the mountain before you climb the mountain. Amen? You got to be willing to climb the mountain for God to move it. So whatever you're going through, I got news for you today. Just face it head on and be brave. The Bible says be strong, be courageous, and God will move on your behalf. But here's the thing. He needs a willing participant. All right? Are you willing... Now, many of you come to God and you say, Lord, if you get me out of this situation right now, you help me through this worst event of my life. I will serve you all the days of my life. And then two weeks later, he's smoking dope down the beach. That is another true story that has happened to this church. Somebody in this church. Because I went to the beach and I saw him smoking weed. Pastor, I, uh, you know what? I was busy. Busy at the beach smoking weed. Okay, hey, I get that. Like me, I get busy praying for people. You get busy smoking a bong. Whatever. Everybody got their level of busyness. Amen? But here's the thing. If you're going to make a deal with God, how I many you know that there's an enemy listening also? He wants to see if you follow through. God is only waiting for willing participants. Are you willing to go? Are you willing to be used? Everybody says yes until God starts using you. You know what the number one problem with people who fail in any kind of ministry endeavor is? I'll tell you. The number one thing that stops people from doing ministry or their life's work for God is people. Say that loud. Amen. You know why? Because if you're going to get into the word ministry, you, you have to attribute ministry to people with issues hello see how quiet it gets when there's truth in the air notice there's no static right now if you want god to be the victor in your life he already is but he's looking for you to be willing amen so let's look at this story in matthew 14 take a look here let's come down to verse 14 all right hang on hang on here it comes Verse 14. All right. Here's the thing. Jesus liked to go and be alone. How many of you like being alone sometimes? Well, you got to love it sometimes because people will sap you. Yeah? Now, we get here. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. How many of you know that Jesus was in demand? Amen. How many know that you're in demand sometimes? Well, and when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. So no matter what, how many know that Jesus is always there, even in the midst of him in bodily form, he would get tired. We all get tired. We get fatigued, right? When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. How many know that the disciples had not much faith? They're looking at realities. They're looking at, we no more nothing. We no more. So we need to send them to McDonald's so we can kick back. But Jesus is about to create the greatest miracle of all time. He's about to make a filet of fish. You ready? Ready? 
no matara sauce though, unless Jesus did another miracle on top. But, but Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. So Jesus is not going to even do it. What does he tell them? Read it carefully. Don't miss nothing in the story. You, you, give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. If you add it up, seven is the number of completion, pretty much, right? All right. So how, mu- how many loaves? You guys from Hilo. Five loaves. Two fish. See, I told you, some of you guys hang over. Okay. He said, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now the number 12, if you add the 2 in numerology, biblical numerology, 12 is 1 plus 2 is 3. That represents the Trinity. How I many you know that God is always the God of the overflow in your life? No matter what, there's always left over for others. Amen? Uh, let's go up a little more. Let's see. There was something I wanted to show you that maybe sometimes, you know, people who don't pay attention, because I said Christianity's greatest asset is when a Christian can pay attention he says here, uh, immediately, oh, let's come down a little to 21 again. Let's see this. Now read verse 21. This is where it gets kind of hairy because a lot of people, ah, oh, man. Read it carefully. What does it say? Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men. So did Jesus feed the 5,000? He fed way more than 5,000. Because you know each man has a wife and probably 2.4 kids. Back then, maybe 6.8 kids. I don't know. But you see how even the Bible, people interpret it wrong. Because slide all the way down to the open. The, they had like a title over this section. So go all the way down. Keep going. Right there. What does it say? Feeding. Now go back to verse 21. You see how you, you can pick up error if you're paying attention. Now, those who had eaten were about 5,000 men. Besides women and children. So, is there way more than 5,000? So, the miracle is way greater than even man. The guy who tried to put this Bible together screwed it up. 5,000 men besides women and children. So, how many kids running around eating filet fish that day? How many women eating filet fish? Hallelujah. You know there's McDonald's throughout the whole Bible, right? You just got to pay attention. You know, when Elijah was by the brook, the ravens came and fed him. They brought in bread and meat. He had the first hamburger in history. Was very... You guys are giant mom. When Moses was in the desert, God would rain down French fries. And chicken McNuggets. Oh my God. You guys never see it, huh? It was. Why is everybody always going to McDonald's? Because it's throughout the whole Bible. McDonald's better pay me something for using their name. You see, if you understand how the Bible works, how many of you, how many of you that was revelation for you? Just seeing something like that. It's because we are so programmed to. Just go with what somebody said. I'm here to tell you something. God is raising up a new breed of Christian, and it's you. You know, we are making an impact around the world from Hilo. You know what is amazing? That we live in Hilo, the most gossip-filled evil place on the planet. But we are all victorious. Amen. How many of you are a victim of gossip? Come on now. Don't even lie to me. Somebody talks stink about you. They hug you and stick the rusty butter knife in your back. Yeah. Why do people do that? It's because they're in competition. I'm here to break the trend. Our church is not in competition with anybody. Okay, we're no slouch, but we're also not better than anybody else. We just enjoy a different understanding. Why? Because we're going to be the church that is known for paying attention. We're going to be the the church known for common sense. How many of you like common sense? Especially after you make the biggest mistake of your life and then it's staring you in the face what you should have done. 
you are all a victim of common sense. Amen? So let's operate from common sense so we don't have to be traumatized by common sense later. Amen? So read in your notes now. Jesus made the disciples get into a ship and sail to the other side. Now we're going to that. Okay? We're going to go here because I just wanted to show you guys something. You guys cool with that? Okay, so we're going to be the people who pay attention. What are we going to pay attention to here? Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. This is now after everybody was fed, everybody's cool, and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. All right? Are you a person that likes to be alone, and as soon as you get by yourself, you call somebody up? Hey, what you doing? You like do something. What you doing? Nothing. What you doing? Nothing. You like do something together. What do you like do? I don't know. What a waste of conversation. Anyway. Hallelujah. People are highly addicted to people. Amen. How many are on Facebook right now? You're going to get lickings. Pay attention. All right. Now, when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. What is contrary? Mary and Mary. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. The wind was contrary, meaning the wind was out of the ordinary. It was contrary. Okay, contrary is different. Some of you are teachers in here. You guys get the paper on the wall. You know what paper I get on the wall? Toilet paper hanging on the roll. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Now if you're in the middle of the ocean and it's going crazy and you're out there in pitch black and all of a sudden you see a man standing on the water, what would you think? What is your first thought? I'm sure there's some words. Most Hawaiians would say, how come the night march is still on the ocean? Oh my God, it's on different one. More powerful than all the rest. You guys are going to get lickings. There is no God higher than your God. Amen. Do you know that there is no God out here that is higher than you? Huh? What? Huh? Ephesians 2.6 says that you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know what that means? That everybody on earth right now is seated in heavenly places. I can show you proof. Some people say, oh, no, only after you become a Christian are you seated in heavenly places. No, you better read the word and pay attention. Jesus paid for everybody. Amen. Like I told you before, when somebody passes away, they can have a long conversation with the Lord. I went paramedic school. I understand. You know, one time I was in Florida, I was working. I was a brand new student, right? They sent me on my first ride on an ambulance. I'm like, yay! Because I was only 20 something years old. I'm on the ambulance. I'm like, yeah. I get to see something good. He said, oh, motor vehicle accident, I 75. I 75 is the freeway that runs all the way from Naples, Florida, all the way to Canada. Okay, so I'm, I'm working this place that runs through right through Tampa basically and they say motor vehicle accident we go there and we get there and they say hey you ready to get your feet wet <laughs> yeah yeah and they say go over there and pick up that head <laughs> huh all of a sudden I wasn't speaking good English I was from Hilo bro what <laughs> what you talk what Bro, you guys is nuts. And they're all laughing. No, no, that's part of your duties. And they're all. <laughs> so you bloody howlies going to all get leakings from me. They don't know what I'm saying either, you bloody howlies. <laughs> yeah, huh? I beg your pardon? I said, well, what you like I do with them? So now you got to put on your brave face. You got to put on your big boy BBDs. Because you're from Hilo. So I walk over there like nonchalant, but inside my heart is doing one of these. <laughs> and I, I look at this head, and it's blinking at me. It's blinking, and it's looking at me, and it's trying to talk to me. And I'm like, but you're not connected. And you know what, Donna, me, I asked the doctor in the ER later, I said, you know that 
this guy's head was severed, but he was still talking. And he says, because he's still alive, basically. So I'm here to tell many of you in here, let me dispel some of this reasonings for hell. Okay, and I'll just tell you this because I've been dealing with a lot of death. You guys do understand there's a lot of people passing right now because they're getting closer to the holidays. But here's the thing. It takes a long time for the human body. The human body is designed to survive is what this emergency room doctor, Dr. Smoke was his name. Not S-M-O-A-K. He told me it takes a long time for the human body to die. It is still thinking while it's looking at you. And it's still processing until the spirit leaves. And he says, I'm not a spiritual man, but I'm here to tell you that until the spirit leaves the body, the body is still alive. And it's still able to communicate. It's still able, if you're a God-fearing man, he said, you are still able to pray. You're still able to communicate. It's just his vocal cords were severed so he couldn't audibly talk. But he is having a conversation with you, and it's probably like, help me. Here's the thing. After that, my whole life changed. I started to think along the terms of, people always say that if you don't receive Christ, you're going to hell. I'm here to tell you that even if your head is off, you can still ask for Jesus to come into your heart. You can still, while hanging on a rope, ask the Lord to come into your heart. You can still reconcile yourself to God no matter how bleak and dire the circumstance. So don't ever believe some religious fool who wants to play the part of God and tell you, oh, that person didn't have God, so they went to hell. You know where they're going? They should go to hell. That's just my personal opinion. Many of them are already living a hell. They just want to share it with you. So I want you all to realize that God is far greater than we ever give him credit for. He understands that every man, woman, and child has a need for him. And he is there to collect every one of them and have a conversation with them on their departure from earth. I don't care what age. I don't care what. God is there. How many of you are consoled by that and you feel good about that? So always, always, always make your errors on the side of love. God is love and he would never want anybody to go to hell. Amen? Say amen. So you tell all your religious friends, you go to hell. If they want to go to hell, they can go all they like. Amen. But we ain't going there. Amen. Because our loved ones are going to be waiting for us on the other side. Am I right or am I wrong? I can tell you I'm right. You know why? Because the Bible says, if you read Ephesians 2, it says, then he died for all. Hallelujah. You know, people, they need a swift kick in their brains. Back to our story, boys and girls. That was just my rant against stupid people. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. You guys are going to learn. If this is your first couple times here, hey, I'm a fun-loving guy, and I make fun out of everything. Because life is short, and heaven is forever. Amen. We came from forever. We came here temporarily. We're going back. Everybody want, every one of you has a space suit right here. You, you like your space suit from NASA? One day you take off your space suit and you go where you're supposed to be. How many of you know that heaven is right on the other side of this space suit? This space suit has to have oxygen tanks. <laughs> your lungs, Lolo. Paul called you a pilgrim. He called you a sojourner. He called you a tourist, basically. You're only here on vacation. How's your vacation going? You know that life... It's so quick, bro. You're out of here after that. And you come back with all your vacation pictures that nobody wants to see, except now we put them all on Facebook. You know, when I was a kid, I had these people. My dad, guys, we were very poor. My dad had some very wealthy friends. Every time they go on vacation, they would come back with pictures, and they would put them on the, remember the, the slides? And they would go, and here we are standing in front of, here we are. Standing. And I would be thinking to myself, shut the hell up. You're like bragging to me all the places you went. I don't like here. I kind of go. You know what? You know where I went? When I wanted to take a vacation. You know where I went from Lanakila Housing? Across the street. With my basketball. <laughs> that was my vacation because... I would go away by myself and go play basketball, Lanakila Park, nobody there. 
You know why? La Naquila, everybody rather be smoking dope, shooting drugs, or huffing. I rather be shooting baskets. Little different addiction, yeah. You guys all right, some of you getting the kind. Look at these lolos over here. Verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. They should have put in here, they were scared as hell. Troubled. Look at that. And what did they say? It's a ghost. Oh, Baki. Uh, Fat Sarah. Uh. Oh, my God. What a, how many other ways can you say ghost? Think of every language right there. It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. How many know that these guys were like frantic? They were nuts. You know why? Because it's pitch black. All they see is a person standing out there. Now, I don't know about you. If you saw somebody standing on the water, what would be your first thought? Some of you are that oxygen deprived. You go, hi. <laughs> you need ride. <laughs> That's some of you brilliant ones in here. You guys, some of you talk to me, you know, blink. I don't get problems. Look at my eyes. Anybody who don't blink that much, you better watch it. They're not there, but they're there. Okay. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of. You really think Jesus said that? Come on, man. If you was there trying to make your friend scared, what would you say? Because I know Jesus was a practical joker because it's proven in the Gospels. He was sarcastic. He was always trying to make trouble. He's standing on the ocean. He knows they're afraid. He's like, hi, guys. Be of good cheer. <laughs> Are you kidding me? What would you do? See, we like to wear a bracelet. What would Jesus do? What would you do? He's standing on the ocean. All your friends scared. What would you do? <laughs> Watch these guys. Boo. <laughs> I know what I would do. Go. Nah, nah, nah. I just blame. Be of good cheer. They forget that part. Nah, nah, nah. In Hawaii, we say that, huh? When you make it somebody any kind. Nah, 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 bro. It's only flame, bro. It's me, Lolo. Look, huh? Can you imagine these big, burly fishermen? Out there, they're able to handle, and they see somebody, and it was you. It's all your best friends. You guys all hanging together every day, all day. What are you going to do? Come on now, let's be honest. How many would uh, just be that practical joker that would scare the hell out of them? If I was Jesus, I'd be on one side of the boat, then I'd be disappearing, coming on the other side. Here. Here. You all would do that. No, even act. You bunch of liars. I know you guys already. Yeah? Be of good cheer in his eye. Do not be afraid. This is the real watered down version of reality, in my opinion. Because I know that all of us in here are practical jokers. That's why God sent you to me. Come on now. How many of you like a good laugh? If you don't like a good laugh, this is not the church for you. You better go take your. Take yourself over to First Church of the Holy Enema and just go. Where they try and clean you out and keep you regular. You come, you come. If can, can. If no, can. Go read the banner. All right, and Peter, Peter, the only guy with guts. You know why? You get more guts than brains. How many of you got a family member like that? How many of you are that family member? Well, everybody call you because you get more guts than brains. You say the things they, they only think. Yeah, that's part of this ministry. We say the things everybody wish they could say. Like, you guys just heard me a little while ago. I said crap in church, now what? Oh, my God. Shut up. I say way worse things than that. Last Sunday, I kicked my copier right on my little toe. I found out this week, broke my toe, and I broke a bone in my foot. 
The doctor later on in the week took an x ray, says broken, you like put a pin in, like, blah, blah, blah. you know, they said, forget it, I'm a healing ministry. What are I gonna do? Hang on, guys, let me pray for you. Come over here. <laughs> what you get? Broken toe. Come here, I can. So I decided to brave it and start. You know what? I'm just going to walk right out of this. Amen? Walk right out of it. Hallelujah. This morning, I kicked my toe again on the bloody copy machine. And all of a sudden, the devil appeared. And he said, you get big feet, bro. I really did. I kicked it again. And I said, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Trying to fake my way through it. There were some other words that came out too that was in tongues like rack of mother, father, sister, brother, auntie, uncle. And I said, no. No. I'm going to say 50 F words in a row right now so I don't say it during the sermon. So I said these words in foreign languages that you don't understand. Okay, moving right along. Believe me, my leg is right now and I just went kicked this thing a little while ago that's why I brought it up because rather than fly this puppet and act like I'm preaching real good I'm just trying to brave it right now so when you hug me stay far from my right outer foot This bugger is talking to me while I'm talking to you. And you know what it's saying? Eh? Look at me, look at me. Hey, 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 down here. Shut up. All right. So can we always be of good cheer? How many of you woke up on the wrong side of the bed? Yeah, you know what that means, eh? You woke up on the floor, probably. Because most Hawaii beds is against the wall. <laughs> In the corner. If you woke up on the wrong side of the bed, you're on the floor, bro. Sorry to tell you. What you was doing last night? I like calm. <laughs> Do you guys know invite? You guys think I that? Oh, you shut up. All right. Peter, the only one. God's no brain. Lord, if it is you, <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? Replace the word Lord with bra. And you'll get the meaning a little deeper. Say it. Bra, if that's you. You guys understand that sometimes you can talk real. You all from Hawaii pretty much? You live here longer than one month, you turn in Portuguese, right? You understand that? Bra, if that's you, command me to come to you on the water. Say, bra, if that's you. I'm going to go over there, and you better, you better, you better. So Jesus said, what is your picture of this? Oh, come. Oh, did the angels all open the sky? Oh, put bra in front of come. Bra, come on, come. He has like my interpretation of the Bible. I'm trying to make it more real for you because most of these other guys, they don't do that. They try to be of good cheer. You know what, boys and girls? We need to go out this week and be of good cheer. You know what I'm thinking? Right? I wish I had a pocket knife right now. In fact, I get one. Anyway, I hate preachers that dress up things that are not real. You know why? We're real people. How many of you are a real person? Feel yourself. How many are you still breathing? <gasps> some of you ladies better bust out that makeup mirror and go see if they're still breathing. Because some of you in here, ladies. Silent snoring. If we're going to understand this Bible, we're going to have to be real people. Amen? How real are you? How real was the situation you just went through? Let me tell you something. I tell this to a lot of people. When the furor and the attention dies down from the situation and you're all alone, 
you're going to find out who your real family is at that point. You know, in this room right now, I'll tell you right now, you got some genuine people. You know why? Because we all go through it. And when we all go through it, we expect that one of us will be there for the other. Amen. And that's what church is supposed to be. Church is not a building you go to to punch your time clock and act like you are somebody. Church is who you are when you leave the doors. So if you're going to understand this, you need to understand this is real people and so are you. This is not some pie in the sky kind of theory that doesn't pertain to you. Let me tell you something. One time, I built a swimming pool at my house. And me and my son, Mason, he was about, I think he was eight at the time. He was eight. We built this swimming pool. And he's like, Dad, we're going to practice walking on the water. And you know what? I said, you know what? Let's try. And you know my son, he walked out. He walked out. He took two steps. And he was on the water. And he looked at me and he fell in. He's like, Dad, I did him. I said, I know. I saw. Oh, you must be Jesus. You must be Jesus Jr. And then he said, Dad, your turn. <laughs> I was 350 pounds, bro. If this water can hold me up, bro, this is mean. So I said, okay. He said, okay, Dad, I believe. I believe because I did it. You can. I believe. I said, I can. Watch it. And then I did one of these. I ran across the water. <laughs> As fast as I could. And then I sank in. I said, you saw that? I took three steps more than you, bro. He said, you junior to me. <laughs> and he's little, so he's like, yeah, you more good, dad. You know why? Because you more older. You're supposed to be more smarter than me, right? <laughs> and my response to that, that's right, son. Because I'm older and wiser, I'm smarter than you. Always remember that the rest of your life. And you know what he did? He did a thing that we call in Hawaii called bus laugh. He's like, <laughs> he said, Dad, you never even walk on the water. You didn't fall right in. <laughs> I ran, that's why. I didn't walk. I did one better than Jesus. I didn't walk. I ran across the water. Get it right, son. See, here's the thing. What would be the purpose of walking on water anyway? Think about it. How much fish are you going to catch if you're walking on the water? You're going to throw your hook and land on the top of the water. What are you going to catch? Coal. Amen. Hallelujah. What is the purpose of this story then? You gotta, what is the purpose of the story? A lot of people like to teach, well, it's building faith. He's trying to show all the disciples how powerful he was. He's trying to show. Let me tell you something. Jesus never does something unless there's a lesson attached to it. Amen? Here it is. Let's see. So Jesus had come, and when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked. Everybody say walked because that's past tense. You know what past tense means? He accomplished it. He walked on the water to go to Jesus, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, that we like to focus on the word boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out. Hallelujah. What was the killer, if you want to call it that? Of Peter's so-called faith. Wind? I mean, you would say wind. Because that's the first thing, right? What does he see? He saw that the wind was boisterous. He was afraid. Um, let me share something with you. He was, they were all afraid in the boat when they saw Jesus on the water already. So how can you be afraid and afraid? Where's the lesson in afraid and afraid? Scared, scared. Where's the lesson? Keep reading this. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus, did you notice how many immediately's were in this set of scripture, by the way? That's a whole crap load of immediately's if you're paying attention, right? He stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. That means you want to know what the lesson really is? Look at the word wind. And then you look at the, the name. One of the names of the devil is prince of the powers of the air. Wind and air always go together. The wind was boisterous. That means that the wind was talking to him. So the wind may not be the wind that we think. 
It may be the whispers on the wind that we believe. Whatever you're going through, be careful for what you believe in the midst of your circumstances. Because there's always a voice of common sense that comes along to rescue you out of your worst situation. If you're paying attention, you will find that voice and listen to it. If you don't, the wind will kick up and it will blow you away. The wind. You guys all know that the wind represents the enemy's temptations, suggestions, and theories. Because these things circulate like wind through your head because many of us, we take out our brain when we're going through something and we let the wind blow in our head. Hello. Let me give you a word. Hello, hallelujah. I know the kids, they always say, hello. No, wind, wind. Your greatest enemy is thoughts. Because when you're alone, the enemy loves to kick up some wind in your head. He likes you to suppose. You know, I'll say this to you guys, and I've said it many times. In fact, many great preachers around the world on TV have stolen my stuff. Hallelujah. All right. That was my attention getter for all the guys that steal my stuff. All right. The enemy's greatest weapon is to steal your time. That's all. He wants to rob you of time. Why? Because you can't manufacture time. So what do you think his greatest weapon is again? Stealing your time. Why is he trying to steal your time? Because if he can get you off of this onto something else, he stole that opportunity for you. And here it is. How many of you go off by yourself and then thoughts come? And then before you know it, all this time has elapsed and nothing got done. That's how you know the enemy came on thoughts. Anytime you get this position in life and you say this to yourself, and I said it just, what, last service, I guess, or a couple services ago, I wonder. When you use the words, I wonder, how many know that the enemy has just come to plant something in you so that you don't operate by belief. Hallelujah. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Doubts only come when you wonder. Hello? Am I making sense to you? Because in the world of wonder is wonderful. You only get wonderful when you wonder too long and it comes out in your favor. When it doesn't come out in your favor, it ain't wonderful. You wonder why it never work. I hope I make it sense to some of you because some of you are like, what is this guy all about? Hallelujah. Lanakila Housing. That's where I formulated a lot of my thought processes. You know why? I was a great observer of people. How many of you deal with a lot of people on a daily basis? Yeah, whether it's children, adults, older people, maybe you're in the service business. How many of you deal with a lot of people? That's a lot of opportunity to look at people and wonder what the heck is going on in that head of theirs. Well, here's the thing. They all come to you because you represent some kind of authority and dominion. They are looking for that. Whether you believe that or not, people are looking to you for leadership and guidance. Hello. Now, what kind of a leader and what kind of a guide are you? If you're blind and you don't know the way. You know, my friend one time, he said he went to this place and it was in the Appalachian Mountains. I don't even know where the Appalachian Mountains is. I had to go look on Google. And you know what he told me? He told me this. He said he went to this place and they were going to take him on a hiking tour. And he got to the place, the lodge, where you check in to go hiking. And he got there and this guy was wearing sunglasses. He said, oh, I better put my sunglasses on. It must be sunny. Put on his sunglasses. And this guy busted out from his bag a stick that looked like a candy cane and went. Chuk, 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 chuk. And he says, you ready for your hike? The guy was wearing sunglasses because he blind. And he busted out his stick from the back of it. He said, you ready for your hike? And my friend was like, what's the stick for? So we don't fall off the cliff. <laughs> How do you know? You better trust this guy with all your might. The blind leading the blind. 
Oh my God. You guys only got that now. Let me back up the car. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> my friend's going on a hike in the Appalachian Mountains. There's a lot of cliffs. There's a trail. A blind guy is leading the hike. Hello. How many of you would say, ah, nah, catch the next group, bro. I would follow the guy because he gets the stick and he's been on this trail, I hope, more than once. Now, if a blind guy with a stick got on a bike and told me, let's go, I draw the line right there. <laughs> but it, my friend said it was the most wonderful hike because the guy said, close your eyes, listen, you hear the birds, you hear this. And the guy said, whoa, hang on. And you know what the blind guy told him? Wait. There's rocks falling. And my friend was like, lucky I had on blind guy leading me on on hike. <laughs> that don't even make sense to your head. You know why? Because you cannot make sense out of God. He will take you down paths that you feel like you're blind or being led. Hallelujah. Like, who's leading you? Most of the time you feel like you're alone. But there is a guy that you can't see, but he can see you. And he's taking you down this path and he's telling you sometimes, hold on, that guy is no good. And you girls wake up with him anyway. Hallelujah, moving right along. <laughs> Thank God you're not with him now, right? Val, you don't want you with. Stroke his hair right now, honey, not you. Tell him, honey, not you. You good. If a guy is in 2015 still wearing a mullet, something is wrong, girls. Something is wrong. That hair helmet was supposed to be put away a long time ago. Oh, my God. You guys don't even know what I'm talking about. That mullet comes with a big gold chain usually. And a hunting t-shirt. And long denim shorts. I'm picturing it right now. And work shoes with white socks. No more watch, so he always asking you what time. He gets cigarettes, but no more light up. He get car, but no more registration or insurance. He get one truck and get one hunting rack on the back. Okay, moving right along. My dream guy, if I was a girl. I've just played. If that's your thing, that's your thing. Amen. Choose wisely. What's the moral of my story today? Pay attention. <laughs> Choose wisely. You can take a lot out of this message. Which one do you want? Be of good cheer. I don't know. Prince of the powers of the air? Wind? Which part struck you this morning? Some of you just waking up from your nap. Let's recap. Uh, see, we are that kind of church. We are the reality church, right? We are here for you when you need us, and you better be here for us when we need you. We better not have to go wonder where you stay. Get it? Uh, you guys is too much. All right. Let me tell you what you do have. And you can read through all of these notes. Look, look here. Uh, Luke 10, verse 19. I don't mean to keep you long today, but this is, we're at about the one-tenth mark of our sermon today. And I just want to reassure you that the other nine-tenths are going to be just as exciting. I'm joking, you fool. You guys all right? Hang on while the scripture comes up. All right, 19, then where we are. Okay, come down, verse 19. All right, come down even a little further. Let's take a look here. Okay, you guys see that? The 70 returned with joy. All right, this is Jesus' attempts to send people out and do ministry in spite of themselves. So how many of you believe that God can use you? Yeah? The rest of you, what? Where you guys came from? What church you came from? I'm here to help all of you. Okay. 
because what I do, you can do. You may not get the same results because you believe different or whatever, but we're all here to help somebody. How many of you can help somebody? Let me tell you this. How many of you don't believe you're called to any kind of ministry, that you're just a, a bump on a log and you're just here to be a rock? You want to be a high-level minister? I've said this before. How many of you want to be a high-level minister? Highly used of God, highly successful. The Bible says those that keep their mouth shut are considered the wisest. Okay? So here it is. You want to be a high-level minister? Do this. You got to master the art of nodding your head and smiling. Some of you are practicing already. Practice. Come on, everybody. Smile and nod your head. You got to quote Bob Marley. Every little thing. Say it. Every little thing. Is. You got to quote another Bobby. Bobby McFerrin. Don't worry. Every little thing. I'm going to be a man. Pass out the weed right now. This guy's not high enough. We got to get you high. Because then you'll understand the message of the meaning, right? <laughs> Some of you are like, yeah, well, you get, yeah, that's all, yeah. My supplier stay in. I kind of dry this week. I got to wait till he bail out. Every little thing. Why was Bob Marley talking to three birds? Anybody got that answer? If you sit in there long enough to listen to three little birds, something is wrong. You are high. You are high or severely depressed. That you need three little birds singing sweet songs. <laughs> Everybody, Pastor Denise is in the dark. Can we help her? Every little thing, practice now. Nod your head. Smile. Small smile. Nod. <laughs> that makes you crazy. Small, sly smile like you know something they don't know. Every little thing. It's going to be all right. Don't worry. Be happy. And then you got to master the long blink. Hit the nod. And you have just graduated from Bible College 101. You have your master's degree in ministry. Because you have been so silent, people will seek you out for your wisdom. Hallelujah. You know, one time I was listening to the Dalai Lama himself. I mean, a lot of celebrities that I minister to, they, they look at this guy as their pope. Ooh. This guy cannot even put on pants. This guy quoted something that I got from God, and I had never heard it anywhere. And I said something, and he quoted it. And one of my celebrities that was on the phone, he's like, Hey, man, the Dalai Lama stole one of your lines. I said, That punk. No, I didn't. I just said, Well, hallelujah. I am highly honored that the Dalai Lama would steal one of my phrases. I mean, you know, there's no new thing under the sun. No matter what you say, people will use it. But he says it, and people are like, oh, my God. I said it called me sarcastic. They called me one punk. He said something along the lines of common sense. He was attributing common sense to being at peace and harmony with the universe. And you know what I said in pidgin English, huh? If you just use common sense, you would get very far in life. In fact, everything in the universe would follow you. And one celebrity said, that's the same exact thing you said. He just reworded it. I said, yeah, yeah. Maybe I should wear one robe. <laughs> what do you guys think? How, how I would look with on robe and bare feet? Then I can walk around Hilo with a little drum. <laughs> Let's do a new trend. Let's use two different color slippers like when we were kids and one surf shots with Ampuka in the crack. How about one uh, surfing shirt that the sleeve's too short? 
and we just say bra, 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 bra. How many, how many different ways can you say bra? Say it when somebody acting stupid. Bra. Say it when you're concerned. Bra. Say it when you're stuck behind somebody that no turn on the red light and then turns green with the arrow and they no turn. What do you say? How would you say bra in that situation? Bra. How about when you come home and your kids' clothes is all over the room? And you walk by the door. What do you, how would you say bra in that situation? Bra. You see, we can master communication worldwide with one word. Right from Hilo, Hawaii. We can, bra. We can master the universe. So nod, smile, and say bra instead of all the other stuff. How's that? Bra. Bra. Ah, you guys will always win if you follow me right off the cliff. Cause <laughs> you like my candy cane. Watch out, rocks falling. Hmm, maybe, maybe. All right, did we do this thing? This is the thing here, verse eighteen. This is what Jesus said. Now, what does he say? Cause he's Ah, bra, Jesus, bra. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've said this before. It's probably the most out of order statement that Jesus ever made in the whole Bible. It made no sense. Well, a couple other things, but this one. Take a look. They came with joy. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said to them, "I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven." And notice, heaven is not a capitalized place. You guys see that? How many teachers in the house? How many people with college degrees? Whenever it's a noun, what? Person, place, or thing, or stay into a place, shouldn't it be capitalized? But it's not. Why? Hmm. You know what I think? This right here, heaven, is a concept. It's an idea. It's a place. He fell from a place of thought. He thought he was somebody. You guys understand that better? You guys are from Hawaii? The devil thought he was somebody, but he been fall down. Oh, you guys slow. 19, behold, I give you, what does Jesus give them now? The authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. Huh. Is this another out of place thing, Jesus? What are you trying to do here? Uh, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. What is the power of the devil anyway? Let me ask. Anybody know? I, I said it earlier. What do, you, what, do you, what do you remember from paying attention? What is the power of the enemy? Suggestion, wasting of time, thoughts, making you wonder. Huh. Do you know that this, is, this sums up your greatest enemy in one statement? Take a look now. Serpents and scorpions gives you the definition. A serpent, by definition, is not really a snake. It's Jesus' attempt to explain to you who your enemy is. A serpent is a spirit of deception. Hallelujah. So what would a scorpion be? The hurt that is associated with it. The poison. Now think about it. A serpent and a scorpion... If Jesus gives you the authority to trample on the spirits of deception, which are, there are two of them right here. Both of them are spirits of deception, right? If he gives you authority to trample on these things, then what power does the enemy have over you? This. If he can get you to waste time by making yourself wonder. Because when you wonder about something, you don't quite trust and if you don't trust something, you'll never engage it. If you don't engage it, you'll never walk into victory because you always keep it away because you're always wondering about that person. It's always a person that the enemy tries to get you to mistrust or distrust. He doesn't want you to engage this person because two, according to the Bible, together are a very formidable foe for him. Why? The power of agreement always destroys the works of the enemy. 
The greatest agreement you can have in your life is the me, myself, and I. All three within one. You being in harmony with yourself. How many of you are getting something out of this? Spirits of deception. So the enemy's greatest weapon is making you think too long and too hard so that you miss the opportunity. You guys get it? That's why when Peter's standing and telling Jesus, tell me, come, because he's trying to get Jesus to tell him, take away this doubt and unbelief. Take away the wonder. I wonder if I can, but I won't unless you tell me to come. Oh, man, some of you, that is the greatest message you ever heard in your life. You're not saying nothing. You're looking at me like you're drunk. Hallelujah. Nothing shall by any means hurt you if you can get past the spirits of deception. You got it? You get it. Blink if you get it. Because like, Bro, how big you like this thing? <laughs> Megan, blow up on the word. <laughs> Hallelujah. It says here, Nevertheless, don't rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Your destination is already solid. You already know where you're going. Why? Because when he finishes his work, we're all going to be in heaven together anyway. Amen? Finish work. Finish work. All right. Hey, bra. You can read the rest of this on your own. I'm Paul. I'm not going to keep going. Some of you are like, oh my God.